a hundred years ago, there was a great debate over whether it was possible to reverse a declining culture. Maybe the most important question that we're asking over these three days. Otto Spengler was the first to speak. He said there is no chance. He said that cultures are like organisms. They a birth, they grow sometimes to a great height and then they start to decline. And once you're on that declining slope, forget any chance of renewal. He said, if you find yourself in that situation, he'd advise you to go to the beach. Have fun, do whatever you want while you can, because your civilization is toast. Arnold Toynbee disagreed and he presented the world with the largest book of history that has ever been written, 12 volumes. And in those 12 volumes, he surveyed just about every civilization that has ever been created. Here's what he said. He said, there is something spiritual about civilizations and culture, which means there is always a chance of rebirth. And he said that the groups that cause these rebirths are typically small groups of senior leaders. He called them creative minorities. And I want to tell you a story, given that it's tea time, and to give you an example of such. I'd like you to come with me, please, back almost 200 years in this nation's history. It's the early 1840s, and Britain is mired in darkness, despair, and poverty. Queen Victoria has just survived an assassination attempt in Hyde Park. And within a few years, the nations of Europe are tottering on the edge of revolution. There is fear of just the same here as plans are made for a giant protest gathering on Kennington Common, just over the river, and then marching to Parliament. The fear was great enough that the night before, elites started quietly slipping out of London. The great British weather, however, intervened. It poured with rain the next day. The protests were a giant, were a damp squib. But historians say that just as that potential for revolution died, so another revolution began, which they say was just as great as the French Revolution or the Industrial Revolution, but has largely been forgotten. Simon Heffer called it the revolution of the high minds. Ian Hislop called it the revolution of the do-gooders. Asa Briggs simply called it the age of improvement. It was a time where leaders right across the board, artists and authors, politicians and scientists, thinkers and writers, all started asking, what can I do to serve? Rather than focusing on my own uh, achievements, how can I contribute? And it changed this nation. Of course, for that sort of change to happen, there has to be some sort of animating spirit or energy. And it was probably best expressed by Matthew Arnold in his book, Culture and Anarchy. It was subscribed, be ye therefore perfect. And in this book, Matthew Arnold had a go at the middle classes. He said, you guys have traded your ambition for comfort. He said, you guys are so enamored now with freedom of speech and quiet and safe streets that you're no longer longing or working for something better and greater. And here was Matthew Arnold's suggestion of what was better and greater. He said it is to shoot for a community of nations or a nation with great character and great culture. If this spirit, of course, was to last, if it was to really animate, animate, there had to be some decisive moments, some moments which caught the imagination of the people. And one of those emerged shortly after, for the big political issue of the day was free trade. The question was, will the landowners give up their tariffs, which have made them wealthy, in order that the poor would again be able to afford to buy bread? 
And it was Sir Robert Peel, who historians say made one of the great decisions of moral courage in British political history when he went against his own tribe for the sake of the nation. And he passed the Corn Laws, which enabled the poor to eat again. But an animating spirit and a decisive moment, of course, is not enough. You need iconic leaders. There are many examples that I could give you, but just to pick one, the royal consort, Prince Albert. Here's what the Bishop of London said of him at his untimely death. He said, Prince Albert has devoted himself to the care of all and to the extension of the arts and the sciences. Of course, once you've got a moment and leaders and a spirit, what really needs to be given attention is the institutions that shape a nation. I think of institutions like the great pillars that hold up the canopy over our national homes, the canopies that provide shelter and warmth and safety for us. If you were in Britain at this time almost 200 years ago and you wanted a top position in the army or the civil service, then you could buy it. And nobody was going to ask you any questions about your ability to lead an army to victory on a battlefield or to marshal battalions of civil servants in order to run a country effectively. It was the same in the universities. Instead of looking for the very best minds, there was a certain ideological conformity as it was insisted that everybody sign the, the Church of England's 39 articles before they were allowed to study or to teach at these great institutions. But within 15 years, these high minds had wiped all of this away. These three institutions and others became bastions of meritocracy. They became places where the brightest and best really could serve and lead, and they laid the foundations for the modern world as a result. But once a nation starts growing, it's not just a matter of renewing the institutions that exist, but you create new ones as well. The Germans at this point were having a go at the Brits they were saying, this is a land without music. No Beethoven, no Brahms, no Haydn in Britain. So what did these high minds do? They didn't fight back with words. They didn't disappear under a slope of self-criticism. They created something new. This was it. It's the college, the Royal College of Music. And within 30 years, we were hearing in this land great musicians and their works like Vaughan Williams and Gustav Holtz and Benjamin Britten. But it wasn't just the arts where in new institutions were established. There was a whole gamut of them. The Royal Albert Hall was built at this time to give great experiences to countless thousands of people. There were museums. These museums were not simply created for the posterity of the past, but they were there to educate and inspire for the future. Museums like the Victoria and Albert, like the Natural History Museum, and like the Science Museum. As well as on the same site as these four other great institutions, Imperial College. Imperial College created to be a leader in education and scientific research, which of course it still is to this day. And so as they went about revolutionizing Britain, Toynbee, had he been around, would have said, don't just think about the things that you create and the things that you de develop. He said, this is the greatest test of a great culture. It is solving the, unex the unexpected problems that you create through the development of your ideas. Of course, in Britain, one of those as the cities grew and grew and grew was public health, typhoid, cholera, sweeping across the cities. In 1858, in this nation, we had a summer of intense heat. The amount of human and industrial effluent that had gone into the Thames, along with the reduction of water because of the heat, caused the great stink. It was said that one lungful of this toxic smell was enough to kill you. It certainly meant that the politicians all left the Houses of Parliament as a result. But it caused another of these high minds to go to work, to 
create rather than to complain, and he laid 1,200 miles of sewers. And as he did so, he insisted that they weren't just large enough for the needs of Victorian London, but the needs for generations to come. He was so foresightful that we're only just, literally this day, replacing those sewers. But maybe the greatest problem of all was poverty. And maybe there wasn't another generation that so gave themselves to their own attempts to solve, to seek to eradicate uh, that disease and that great challenge. They went into bat in great numbers. It was Bernardo and Muller who started homes for orphans in the East End and in Bristol, respectively. It was Octavia Hill and John Ruskin who did the first experiments in social housing. Robert Rake single-handedly started the Sunday School movement and was educating 75% of this nation's youth at one point in time. Dickens and others started writing using their pens to bring poverty to the attention of those for whom otherwise they would know nothing about it. And Lord Shaftesbury found his heart broken by news of women who one week are giving birth and the next week are down the mines and children who have been disciplined with pickaxes to the head. But maybe the greatest reformer of all was this lady, if we're able to have the sli slide up. Her name? Angela Burdett Coots. She was the wealthiest woman in the country. I haven't got time to tell you the long list of initiatives that she was involved with, but the poor loved her, and one time when they were marching through London, they stopped at a house in Piccadilly and they applauded her for two hours. They called her the Queen of the Poor. If we want to pull a culture out of a nosedive, creative minorities are what really matters. Small groups of senior leaders who will live with a different value set from everybody else, but also refuse to be exiled from the center of the culture that is theirs and work for the good of all. And as they do so, they find that it matters so much that it's no longer professional, it's personal. That the colleagues that they work with are not simply workmates, but they're friends as well. Here is how, and I hope this quote can come up, here is how Simon Heffer, the historian, described the results of the revolution. He said, a spirit of, or, or cast of mind that transformed a wealthy country of widespread inhumanity, primitiveness, and barbarism into one containing the germs of widespread civilization and democracy. A sense of earnest, disinterested, moral purpose distinguished many politicians, intellectuals, and citizens of mid-19th century Britain and drove them, to see, drove them to see to improve the condition of the whole of society. The pursuit of perfection, as Matthew Arnold called it, a minority activity in 1838 had become almost an obligation by 1880. Now as I come into land, I wonder whether you'd allow me to move back to the current times, and I wonder whether you recognize this man. This is Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian ever. In 2008, eight races, eight gold medals, seven world records. Often races that were only a matter of a few hours apart. All the analysts, all the experts, all the critics, said that what he was trying to do was impossible. So you can imagine the scenes after his final race, eight gold medals around his neck and the press pack pressing in on him saying, Michael, how on earth did you do it? Do you know what he said? His answer was this. He said, it just takes a little imagination. And I want to invite you, as we start this session, to just exercise a little imagination. What would your community, what would your nation, what would our world look like if the high minds went to work again? If they started to organize themselves in creative minorities, prepared to live differently, but for the sake of the culture and the story that has shaped us and shaped our nations for centuries, in order that this might not be a stopping point, but rather a continuation 
of good things and blessing and prosperity for the world as a result. Thank you very much.